All right, we had some fun in the first chapter, messing around with, playing with the slide, playing a little bit of Samson Delilah, getting an idea of where we're heading with these techniques. In this chapter, this is where we roll up our sleeves and get some things done. Because there's a couple of concepts and a couple of techniques you need to work on to get that blues phrasing happening in your banjo play. See, one of the things that's happening when you're playing blues in the banjo, as I said earlier, your voice is singing the melody, and your banjo is laying down a rhythm and throwing in some cool effects. And the easiest way to illustrate the difference is, remember what we did with Samson and Delilah. Delilah was a woman, she was fighting back. Banjo's not playing anything close to the melody. If we go to a country song, like Wildwood Flower, the melody is, I will twine midst the ringlets of raven black hair. And we play on the banjo. Which makes some parts of playing country music a little bit more logical to some folks because you sing the melody, you play the melody. You sing the melody, you play the melody. In the blues, you sing the melody and your banjo's going nuts. It's laying down rhythms, it's laying down effects. So in order to get used to that, to make that switch so that you can sing a melody and play effects on the banjo, you've really got to have some concepts down. And your basic Fraley strum is the center of all of it. And the first thing you want to do is just take a really little bit of time every day and just play around with something simple. And a good song to work with for this particular idea is Mingle With Blues because it's another really easy song uses three chords, G, C, and D. And what we're going to do is just go through the basic framework of the song. Frail the rhythm, simple chords, sing the melody. If you're ever in Memphis, get down to me. third string, fourth string, with my basic frailing strum. We have a G chord. If you're ever in Memphis, get down to Minglewood. We go to C. If you're ever in Memphis, get down to Mingle. Back to G. D. The women treat you right there. C. Treat you like they G. Now before you do anything, hit the pause button and Get to the point where you can sing that couple of verses and frail that pattern. I'm going to do it one more time with you. The repetition drives things home after all. If you're ever in Memphis, get down to Mingo. If you're ever in Memphis, get down to Mingo. The women treat you right there, treat you like they should. It's simple. It's basic. If you can't do this, hit the pause button. And if need be, go to archive.org or howandtow.com or pickware.com and watch the first four workshops in our Frailing Banjo series. Because if you don't have this, there's nothing to build on. Because all we're going to do now is blues up the song. And what we're going to do is very simple but it's a matter of timing. See, if you throw, just fish around for a lick or try to wedge things in without the timing being smooth, it's not the blues anymore. It's mechanical. 
You want to have this part down, so you can just knock it out. The same lick we used for Samson Delilah. Fourth string, third fret, third string, third fret. If you throw a hammer on in there, it, it'll start to come together. If you're in Memphis, get down the middle. But we can make it even more interesting and throw in a rest and some phantom hammer-ons. Now a rest is a moment of silence with a note value attached. In other words, if we replace the initial quarter note in the frailing strum, one, two, and three, four, and if you notice while I was counting, picking hand still moving. I'm not breaking the rhythm of this hand. Think of it like the driving arm on a steam engine train. It never stops. I may decide not to hit a string to give the note value of that part of the motion a moment of silence, but I never just, you know, a rest. No. Motion never stops because once you're out of that motion, you know, Newton's laws come into play. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. An object in rest tends to stay at rest. So if you, okay, I have a rest here. I can, you know, fish around for something. I can, rhythm's going. So when you're playing a rest, all that's happening is, is you're not hitting a string. But you're keeping either the quarter note or one of the eighth notes moving, just not hitting air. So there's nothing you have to learn. It's just a matter of, okay, I don't feel like hitting a string right now. Or, or, that sounds kind of bluesy on its own, doesn't it? Now what a phantom hammer on is, is where you're hammering onto a string without striking the string with your picking hand. You're making a melody note with your fretting hand. So just try a third string, third fret, fourth string, fourth fret. First string at the fifth fret. Third fret. Get used to how it feels. Now you notice on a well set up banjo, mylar head, nice and tight, got a good solid pot, good tone ring, really low action, light gauge strings. The reason I like this setup is I can just drop my finger on the fretboard and make music. And if I mix that phantom hammer on in with rests, what happens is you're still playing quarter note, two eighth notes, basic prailing strum. But what's coming out of the instrument is something entirely new. And if we take what I was just doing before, we're playing the first part and the second part of the basic railing strum is rests. Then throw a phantom hammer on, on the first string of the fifth fret. Is that cool or what? Listen to some blues. Sometimes a stark framework like this can really set off a piece of music. When you listen to John Lee Hooker, sometimes something that stark, played in rhythm, can have a really powerful effect. And if we play around with these ideas, what happens is we get a whole new feeling into our bl blues banjo playing. It becomes the blues. And if we just experiment with those notes I was just playing with, fourth string at the third fret, third string at the third fret, first string at the third fret, first string at the fifth fret. We've got a whole lot of potential for open G chord. Now we got to look at the C chord. <laughs> and all of a sudden things start to change because we have three of our four strings fretted. So we got to think of a way to get some hammer on, some phantom hammer on, some effects into a closed chord form. 
we have an open string. And if we use pinky power, we can drop a phantom hammer on, on an open third string. Now the first few times you try this, your little finger isn't going to want to do it. Don't force it. And don't run out. And they're selling little weights now. You can tie to your fingers, you know, do like finger push-ups. Don't do that. Be nice to your hands. Okay? Just practice a nice light touch with your C chord. And just practice dropping that little finger down on the third string, third fret. Then practice. What we're doing, we're dropping a phantom hammer on, third string at the third fret, we're taking it off, and we're taking our middle finger, which is over on the fourth string at the second fret, moving it over to the third string. So we got dropping it back on the fourth string. So it's third string, third string, fourth string. Throw that into the basic frailing strum. Okay, sounds pretty cool. We've got a walking bass all of a sudden. If we play around with it, Play it as a power chord. Now, power chords were developed for electric guitar because the two D strings, actually three D strings, we don't have a full chord. We only have two notes of the chord. And that makes it sound more powerful. It's all three D notes. Now we can go and play around with that same pattern we did the C chord. Because if you look at the fret chord, Watch my hand. We have a C chord, we're going to a D chord. It's the same chord, we're just moving it up the neck. So what we were doing with the D, you're gonna practice that on your own a few times. I'm not gonna hold your hand too much here because part of what makes this work is experimenting with it, finding a way that works for you. But if we take those two ideas and mix in one other one, what I'm doing there, I'm playing a rest and a phantom hammer on the first string at the fifth fret. Then going back and playing a phantom hammer on on the third string at the third fret. got some kind of cool licks to play with. What happens if we put them in the Minglewood Blues? If you're ever in Memphis, you got a mango. It's not going to come together all at once, and it's not something that if I tabbed it out for you, you could play note for note. You have to feel it, and as you practice, as you play around with things like that C lick, I love that. As you play around with it, you find banjo sounds that fit your personality, fit how you want to sing the song. and it starts to come together and you won't even think about it after a while. It just sort of clicks. And it won't sound exactly like what I'm playing, but if you're keeping the basic framework of the song the same, it doesn't matter. So always use as your acid test the original framework of the song, the basic rhythm, the basic chord progression. Open G. If you're ever in Memphis, get down to Mango. And you got a big space there before the chord changes. So if you play with that, okay, I've got this.
space there to play with all of a sudden. So if you're ever in Memphis, get down to me. Sometimes in that really long space between the chord changes, you can throw in like a finger with blues, a really cool lick, and it's really easy. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the first string at the fifth fret and play a double thumb. And as you know from basic prowling, a double thumb is when we take a single note, a quarter note, and cut it in half by bringing the fifth string into play. And if we count one and two and three and four and it's a full measure. So we're going to play a full measure of double thumbs on the first string at the fifth fret. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three. It's a really simple lick. But at speed. <laughs> At speed, it messes with people's minds. And there again, we're working with basic, simple things. But the effect, when it all comes together, people... D Where did that come from? The first time I ever did Mingle With Blues in a workshop, I was really shocked at the response it got because I was thinking, you know, this is basic banjo. This is dead simple. And people were like, no, it's, it's, listen to how complicated it is. And when I explained it again, people were like, it's that easy? Yeah. That's the magic of it. You don't need a certain pedigree to play the blues. You're not lacking in anything. You're not, you don't have to be super smart. You don't have to be this. You don't have to be that. The person you are, whoever you are, anywhere in the world, you can make blues music with this banjo. And something as simple as... Simple double thumb lick. So play around with that. You've got a great song to mess around with. The song was recorded, by the way, by a fellow named Gus Cannon, who, believe it or not, was a blues banjo man, recorded with Blind Blake, for goodness sake. He played slide banjo. He played banjo in a jug band all the way back in the 1920s. And you want to look for Cannon's Jug Stompers, Cannon and Woods, or just Gus Cannon, or he also recorded it as Banjo Joe. And those original recordings are all over the internet. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. And you can take what you've learned in this chapter and start messing around with some of his other songs. They are wonderful songs. And try it, not any song you want. Get the chord progression down, the framework of the song, and blues it up. Now the next chapter, we're gonna look at two of my heroes, Mississippi John Hurt and Furry Lewis. <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of fun. Until then, practice, keep that simplicity in mind. Remember the song. As complicated as the final project might sound, in the end, it's still, if you're ever in Memphis, get down to me and go to sleep. If you're ever in Memphis, get down to me and go to the tree, you right there, tree.